Hi, my name is Martin Hiraga. Spell my last name, H-I-R-A-G-A. -A. I'm going to talk to you briefly today about a number of things. But before I start talking, imagine a man who was born by mysterious and maybe even miraculous means, who, as a young man, came to a realization of the important place he would have in the world. After which, he spent some time, at about age 30, by himself, meditating, thinking, and planning for his life in the future. After this period of uh, self-analysis and introspection, he then moved on to a public ministry. At his death, there are those who say that this man went on to live another life. Now, if you were thinking Jesus of Nazareth, who is today known as Jesus Christ, you'd be right. But we'd also have to think about Siddhartha Gautama, today known as the Buddha, or Guru Nanak, who is the first Sikh. Those two, those two people, as well as Jesus Christ, lived in an area of the world that we understand to be the continent of Asia. What we're going to talk today about are the religions and the practices of some major Asian religions. Let's start with Hinduism. Okay? Hinduism originated <clears throat> many years before the current era, thousands of years before the current era. In fact, there is no one singular event that led to the origin of Hinduism. However, there are one set of holy books, as it were, or holy chants called the Rig Veda. Rig Veda is spelled R-G-V-E-D-A. The Rig Veda are the stories of the panoply of gods who inhabit this world and other worlds who have an interest in human life. Some of them are Brahma. The most currently well-known ones are Shiva and Krishna. Recently in Washington, D.C., a temple was opened to Devi, D-E-V-I. Devi is a Durga, a female god. It's interesting that Devi, in the Sanskrit language, has the same origins as the Christian word devil. Anyways, Hindus throughout the world are known for a number of things. For example, their Rig Veda, any good Brahma or priestly caste member, would have gone to school to memorize the Rig Veda in Sanskrit an ancestor language to the current Hindu and many of the other languages throughout the Indian subcontinent. The Rig Veda is so revered that if you quote a section or if you name a section of the Rig Veda, any good Brahman will be able to recite it by memory to you in Sanskrit and translate it for you in either Hindi, Hindi or in English. The Brahmin were the scholarly priestly caste, one of four major castes of Hinduism. Castes are like caste groups, and they are familial, meaning they're passed from father to son and mother to daughter. Other castes in the Hindu panoply are the warrior class, the agriculture class, caste, and then another caste that really doesn't have a name that we now understand to be the untouchables. There are hundreds of subcasts to these four castes, and very rarely do people marry 
intercaste between castes. However, now in the subcontinent of India, the importance of the caste is much reduced and more reduced to ritual than to daily practice. Some of you may have encountered Hindus here in the United States or American adherence to Hinduism, such as Hare Krishna. Or you may have encountered a sub-group or a descendant group of Hindus called the Sikhs. The Sikhs are followers of Guru Nanak. Guru, Guru, teacher. Nanak was the person who really originated the form of Sikh, S-I-K-H, Sikhism in India. Sikhism, one of the prime differences of Sikhism is this. The Sikhs believe that there is one omniscient and omnipotent and all-compassionate God. And that if there is only one God, then there is only one caste. Because castes in Hinduism also are adherents to particular gods and goddesses of the Hindu panoply. So those are the religions of India. Remember I told you that Hinduism originated many, many years before the current era. But about 600 years before the current era, during the reign of Asoka, one of his sons, by the name of Siddhartha Gautama, S-I-D-D-H-A-R-T-A, G-A-U-T-N-M-A, -A, began to have realizations in his very young life. Siddhartha Gautama is said to have been born instantaneously or conceived instantaneously and was born and when he was born was able to walk and as he walked lotus leaves flowered along his path. Siddhartha Gautama as a young man was very protected by his father. His father didn't want him to know about the things of the world. For example, Siddhartha Gautama had never seen illness, never seen poverty, never seen old age. And one day, Siddhartha Gautama, in all his rebelliousness, ordered his servants to mount him on an elephant and to ride through the city. Ordinarily, what would happen was Siddhartha Gautama's father would arrange the city so that all he would see was beauty and youth. But it just so happened that as Siddhartha Gautama was riding through the city, he spied through the curtains of his riding chariot on top of this elephant an old man, a sick person death. And he began to wonder about those things. This uh, epiphany for uh, Siddhartha Gautama led him to become an ascetic, someone who denied himself all worldly things. Siddhartha Gautama gathered, well, a group of disciples gathered around Siddhartha Gautama during this ascetic period. And they became the first Buddhists. And Siddhartha Gautama became known as the Buddha. Now the Buddha uh, did not consider himself a great religious figure, but simply a thinker. And he taught four things, now called the Four Noble Truths. First he said, all life is suffering. That suffering, number two, is caused by greed or craving or desire. How people translate that word um, depends on the particular point of view of the, of the translator and the particular Buddhist sect that they belong to. But suffering can only be reduced by getting rid of this greed, craving, or desire. The fourth noble truth is the way to get rid of greed, craving, and desire, and thereby end suffering, is to follow the Eightfold Path. Well, there are principally today about 700 billion uh, Buddhists in the world. Excuse me, there are about 7 billion Buddhists in the world. And they follow essentially three schools of thought. Mahayana Buddhism, 
Hinayana Buddhism and Theravadan Buddhism. Mahayana is the high school, high as an advanced school of Buddhism, and it is the most commonly followed form of Buddhism. Some of the great followers of, of Mahayana Buddhism are Tibetan Buddhists, led by the Dalai Lama, who is said to be a bodhisattva, meaning a reincarnation of the Buddha. Hinayana Buddhism is popularly known and has been followed in places like Japan, where Zen Buddhism is an important form of the practice. Theravadan Buddhism is most commonly followed in Sri Lanka and in India and on the Indian subcontinent where Buddhism originated. The four, the four Noble Truths lead Buddhists to believe that there are things, for example, that are very, very important. One is to let go of all worldly possessions, but not to do it to an extreme. So most Buddhists follow what they call the middle way, not too ascetic and not too sensual. The next thing that Buddhists believe is that the most important virtue that one must have is compassion. Compassion and caring for all things of this world. Hence you will find that many Buddhists live very, very simple lives, whereas some, particularly the lay people, uh, live very worldly lives. In many places in the world, every young man, for example in Thailand, in Laos, every young man spends some time as a monk, learning to be an authentic Buddhist and then goes back to his lay life at some time. However, in Tibetan Buddhism, monks become such for life. And there are not only that, there are nuns, women, who enter monasteries in order to follow the Buddhist dharma or dharma practice for their lives. Remember now, that Buddhism didn't originally start out as a faith or religion or belief, but now many Buddhists uh, believe in a panoply of gods. And in Buddhist temples, sometimes you will find worship to a god. However, that was not what the Buddha, the Lord, the Compassionate wanted. Now, let's move from Buddhism, which is practiced largely, as I said, in Far East Asia, to Islam. Islam is a very important religion in the world today, not only because of events in the Middle East and events in Bosnia and in Kosovo, but <clears throat> because of how the effect it has in Asia. Islam in Asia is practiced in India, in Pakistan. In fact, India and Pakistan are separate countries because India pra in most Indians practice Hinduism and most Pakistanis practice Islam. The followers of Islam are called Muslims. Islam means surrender, to surrender one's will to Allah. And Muslim is one who surrenders. The most important feature of Islam is a, is a cry you will hear from the minaret of a mosque. And that cry is, there is one God, Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. And that is the daily call to prayer. Muslims believe in five pillars. There are five pillars of the, Mus uh, of the Islamic religion. One is an open declaration. There is one God, Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. Daily prayer, five times a day, facing Mecca, which is the holiest of all Islamic cities the giving of zadak, which is an alm to take care of the poor and the needy among uh, followers of Islam. Fasting during the month of Ramadan, when you avoid all kinds of earthly and sensual pleasures in order to, avoid, in order to focus on your belief in Allah. The fifth pillar <coughs> is the Hajj. Alm Muslims 
look forward to a day when they can follow a yearly pilgrimage to Mecca and do a once around pilgrimage between Mecca and Medina, the two holiest sites of Islam. Now, the major places in Asia where you can find Islam are Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Malaysia, Thailand, the Philippine Islands, Saudi Arabia, of course, where Medina and Mecca are, and all of the, all of the countries of what we call the Middle East. Islamic peoples here in the Americas can, were first found in a group of black Muslims called the Nation of Islam. And they're probably the people you're most familiar with, besides uh, those who, those from other nations who are, uh, who have their mosques. But the Nation of Islam, the way I like to look at the Nation of Islam is that it is a uniquely American version of Islam, much like Mormonism is to Christianity, so is the Nation to Islam. All right. So I've described three major religions. Let me describe one more thing: Confucianism. Confucianism isn't a religion, but a system of ethics that were taught by the great master Kung Fu Tse. Kung Fu Tse taught that everyone has a relationship to everyone else in society, and that the most important virtues in life are benevolence to one's inferiors and piety or obedience to one's superiors. And in fact, the concept of rulership in Asia is one of a benevolent ruler. Hence, the relationships between Asians in the hierarchy of Asia, meaning my relationship to my governor, well, to my ruler, my ruler's relation to me, the governed, my relationship to my father and his relationship to me, my relationship to my teacher, and his relationship to me, his student, my relationship to my neighbors or those around me, and my relationship to my brothers are the five most important relationships in Confucian ethics. Now mind you, it is, mind you that I've said Confucian ethics. If you look at Asian countries today, you'll note that Asian countries many times are very tight-knit cultures that everybody is interdependent on everybody else. And these are all led by a Confucian ethic. In fact, Confucianism was the foundation for a number of different religious paths found throughout Asia. Most notably in Japan, Shintoism was a, an evolved system of relationships for Japanese samurai and feudal lords and others who were around them. All right, so we've covered really four kinds of beliefs, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, and the Confucian ethic. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Martin Harago. In 1991 and 92, I became involved in, uh, in services to Asians and Pacific Islanders living with HIV and AIDS in Washington, D.C. Prior to that, I had been involved in a group called ACT UP, the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, in both New York City and Rochester, New York. The AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power was a largely dominantly white group of young gay and lesbian men and women who uh, wanted to create change in the world. Well, all of that was fine. A social change movement is what I am about, after all. However, um, in 1992, I began to have an evolution of how I felt about what was really going on. And I felt like the AIDS epidemic had touched so many people in my life. I've uh, had more than 180 friends die in the AIDS epidemic, including a twin brother, um, that I felt very strongly that I needed to do something different and to focus my energies. So in 1992, I became involved in a small prevention project for Asian and Pacific Islander gay men living in Washington, D.C. And what that meant was, first of all, it meant that I had to contact gay men where they were. 
an Asian gay man. Now, mind you, I'm, uh, I'm Bolivian-born. My ancestors are Japanese. I speak Spanish and English, and I don't really speak any Asian languages. I do speak Thai, uh, because I lived in Thailand for a while. But besides that, I'm not very Asian. Well, I began to do some work with Asian Pacific Islanders, specifically Filipinos and Vietnamese and Lao and overseas Chinese and some Japanese in Washington, D.C. And we began to do an outreach project throughout the D.C. area, primarily in gay bars and where I would meet Asian gay men uh, and talk to them about HIV. But there's a big problem with talking to Asians about AIDS. First of all, there is a huge taboo among Asians against talking about sex, disease, and death. And guess what AIDS is? Sex, disease, and death. Well, that's all right. I would go up to people and talk to them, and I found out that I was getting rejected an awful lot. So what I found out was I had to put up parties, you know, kind of like Tupperware parties, where I would give away you know the food boxes you get in Chinese carryouts? I'd give away food boxes. Or I'd give away, especially towards the Lunar New Year, which happens between February and March, and it's an important date in the Chinese, Vietnamese, and Korean calendars. When the New Year comes around, one gives money to little children in little red envelopes. Well, I discovered that I could get men to take condoms from me if I put them in little red envelopes with Chinese characters on them. Only problem was I could get children to take condoms from me if they were in that. Uh, we decided not to give the condoms to children. But long story short, that is the work that I started to do as a project director uh, in, <coughs> in Washington, D.C. And I later moved to New York City and began work for Apichao the Asian and Pacific Islander Coalition on HIV and AIDS, an organization that was founded in 1986 in New York City because an Asian man couldn't find any support, anybody who understood his needs as he was living with HIV and AIDS. Glenn Izutsu, I-Z-U-T-S-U, was the name of that man, and he became a founding member and the first board president of Apicha. Apicha had a rough beginning. We had a hard time finding people. You know, because Asians, because we don't talk about sex disease and death, well, guess what? We would find our clients in the emergency rooms of hospitals. The executive director of the organization, John Manzon, M-A-N-Z-O-N, and I, both wore pagers along with our case manager, uh, <coughs> We all wore pagers, and whenever a hospital in New York City uh, received an Asian in the emergency room who had symptoms of HIV disease, we'd be paged and we'd go rushing off to the hospital uh, to talk to this person. And often it meant keeping secrets. One of the principles behind AIDS work is that silence equals death. And we believe very strongly that talking about HIV and AIDS was an important part to breaking through the ignorance that we found in Asian and Pacific Islander communities. But you know an important Confucian principle, I, actually it's an important Chinese and Japanese and Korean principle, is that when you have a disagreement or a topic is uncomfortable, you simply don't talk about it. Not at all. Not at all. Well, guess what? In the Asian and Pacific Islander communities of New York, South Asians, Pakistani, Hindus, Indians, Sri Lankans, Koreans, Vietnamese, Filipinos of every language, Japanese, uh, even uh, peoples from the South Pacific, Mongolia, there's a, Mongo <laughs> there's a Mongolian community, believe it or not, in New Jersey. Um, all of them refuse to talk about HIV and AIDS. Well, our job was to convince them to talk. And not only to talk with us, but to talk with others. Because we were not about providing services to the sick, but about empowering people to take control of their own lives. 
and in fact we were community organizing group we along with cab the community against anti asian violence and a number of social or social service organizations in new york city began had been working quite a while with community other communities and community organizations for example up each other began a project called the to lie project to lie in the dialogue language t a g a l o g in the dialogue language see even i can pronounce it um, means bridge we began the bridge project to lie project with the filipino community with a community of <coughs> association of nurses and with the filipino chamber of commerce and apicha working together we began to provide services and specifically food services to Filipinos living with HIV and AIDS. Mind you, in the United States, Filipino Americans are the community that are most impacted by the HIV epidemic. So the Tulai project was this project where, you know, as people with AIDS <coughs> live with their disease and as their their bodies are impacted by uh, by the presence of various opportunistic infections many times people with aids lose the desire to eat but they have to eat because they're losing weight because of the impact of hiv disease so many times the only foods that people will eat are their home comfort foods and to filipinos that means adobo that means fried noodles that means pork that means a whole variety of foods that even i as a japanese american don't know very much about but the tulai project could furnish that kind of food and often because of our connections with the chamber of filipino chamber of commerce and because of the filipino nurses association what we would do is this the chamber of commerce would contact one of their business partners who owned a restaurant that restaurant would cook up a special packaged meal every day for a particular individual and a member of the filipino nurses association would deliver it and we would be the conduit for those two organizations to to do their work and this was a wonderfully very culturally appropriate way for us to make hiv aids and our social work in the community fit together and make it appropriate for the entire community let me talk to you about a couple of cases that we had <coughs> in new york uh, about my third month working at apicha uh, i was the project uh, excuse me, as the programs director. I was second in command at this large age organization. Now uh, a $3 million organization. Well, <clears throat> uh, I directed our client services or care services for people living with HIV and AIDS. And I also directed our prevention programs. We provided prevention information to women, to gay men, and bisexual men and men who did not identify as gay or bisexual but who had sex with men uh young people and uh to community based organizations well as the director of the of programs i also took on the heaviest responsibilities in terms of care for our uh our clients uh we had a number of clients uh who attended a uh, a regular monthly uh, potluck for people with living with AIDS and HIV. <clears throat> and a number of our clients uh, met together uh, for this potluck. And we would provide food for them to meet. Because in Asian cultures, almost universally throughout Asia, is if you want to do business, you have to do food. And we would do really good Chinese food. We'd go down to Chinatown, package it up, bring it to someone's apartment, and it would be there, and we'd have a great meal. But long story short, but some of our clients didn't come through the support group they came through the emergency room remember i talked about the emergency rooms well in flushing there's a hospital in flushing queens um that called me up and said look we have this indian subcontinent man and he's dying and he wants to see his family and at, simultaneously from the united kingdom i was getting this call from the man's brother and at, simultaneous to that i was getting a call in hindi mind you i don't speak hindi okay from the indian subcontinent i can't remember from where um, all I could remember was that I would have to call AT&T uh, and ask for their Hindi interpreters who really didn't get the concept that 
I couldn't tell him these people's names. Long story short, we would have these round conversations about trying to get the family to see the father before he died. The father had in, <clears throat> been infected with HIV, probably here in the United States, because Indian men coming to the United States um, with very little support would find comfort and support uh, by sexual means. I honestly don't know what, how this man got infected with HIV, but it took calls to congressional offices, to the congressional office of Anita Loy, who is the uh, district representative for Queens, uh, congressional uh, calls to Robert Matsui, who was uh, the chair at the time of the Congressional Asian and Pacific Islander Caucus, <clears throat> in, just in order to get this man's family from India to Flushing before their father died. <clears throat> Despite all of our very good work, uh, we weren't able to get the family here because the INS feared that uh, we would that we would not ensure that the family went back to India afterwards. But that was, that was a period, that was a very intense period of high level work that I did for about three weeks uh, as this man's condition became very apparent and as he began to deteriorate. Another, uh, another incident was the case of a Filipino man named Edwin. Now Edwin, uh, uh, was connected to us through the Filipino Nurses Association, and uh, we made use of the Tulai Project. Edwin wanted to go home. One of the things about Asians and Pacific Islanders living with HIV and AIDS is that the strongest desire that they have is to be home and to be with their families. Families are very important to APIs, Asians and Pacific Islanders. Um, and the place where, even if they can't disclose to their families that they have AIDS, which is much of the case, remember I told you silence is a ruling principle among Asians, even if they can't disclose to their family that they have AIDS, their families will take care of them. And Edwin wanted to go <clears throat> to be buried in the Philippine Islands, but there's a problem. The Filipino government will allow a person with AIDS to go home and die in the Philippines, but they will not allow the corpse of a Filipino who had died of HIV here in the United States to be returned home. So we had to get him home before he died. And that was his one greatest desire. Well, the problem was there is a very large Filipino network of family and friends and family of family. But when it came to HIV, it was very hard to get these family members to do anything specific. We struggled for a very long time. In the end, Edwin did die here in the United States. Kind of sad because what a wonderful opportunity it would have been for Edwin to go home and to be with his family. As, as a result, we began a project called Return Home where we helped people go back to their countries of origin or if they were born here, go back home to San Francisco or Tuskegee or Miami or early Idaho to be with their families so that they could have a relationship that was rich and warm and supporting. We also began a project by which our support group began to provide support for people who weren't members of the support group. People would go and visit other people living with HIV and AIDS. The strongest connection that a person with HIV and AIDS can make is with another person with HIV and AIDS. Because we who have HIV and AIDS understand very clearly what it's like to go through life not knowing whether tomorrow will be here. The great and compassionate Lord Buddha said to us, accept life as it is on its own terms. Mind you, that's a contemporary translation. But the Lord Buddha says, accept life, be compassionate. And that was what Apicha was all about. And I am very proud to have been associated with that organization.
Thank you.